Next example. This example will help us again to see better in the definition. Let's consider this funny surface. I hope that from last week we have learned to visualize this surface. What is this surface called? It had a name, by the way. What's this surface called? Hey? Huh? What is it called? Dina. Is it orientable? Does it have mobile strips? No, it doesn't have any mobile strips. So which one is it? It's not N, it's 3. Huh? Sigma 3, that's right. It's called sigma 3. And that's on this sigma 3. So it's a Riemann surface of genus 3. You should learn to say this quickly. Let's consider the following loops. This one, which we shall call K0. This one, which we shall call K1. And this one, which I call, which I call L0. And this one, oops, which we'll call L1. Is the picture clear? I put a rubber band here, rubber band here, rubber band here, rubber band here. OK. Now, question. Which of those loops is isotopic to which one inside sigma 3? First, let's do the easy case. Are k0 and k1 isotopic inside sigma 3? Who thinks they are? Yeah? Who thinks they are not? What do you think? <laughs> This whole row didn't vote. Do you think K0 and K1 are isotopic to each other or not? You can. How do you do it? It's easy. I take this and then slide it over there along sigma, sigma 3. So you can say, you can be courageous and declare, do they, are they isotopic or not? K0 and K1. They are isotopic. So you raise your hand and say, yes, they are isotopic. Yes, it's a very easy question, and I'm a clever person, and I know the answer. OK, so they are, of course, isotopic in K, K0 and K1. So let's make sure that we remember to say inside sigma 3. OK? But it turns out that L0 and L1 is trickier. Do you think L0 and L1 are isotopic inside sigma 3? Who thinks that they are isotopic? L1, L0, and L1. Adrian thinks they're isotopic. OK, some people. Who thinks that, OK, man also. Who thinks that they are not isotopic inside sigma 3? OK, so William thinks that they are not isotopic. What, what goes wrong? Why can't I take this rubber band and slide it over to the other side? Why? When I slide it over, can't I slide it over and put it in this position? Why not? You say it gets deformed, you need under, but it's not clear you, you realize that, right? Yeah. If I keep saying, oh, they are isotopic, and you disagree, and they say, you, you say they are not isotopic, you are not going to convince your opponent by saying, or they get deformed. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Let's say that I disagree with you and you want to convince me that you are right and I'm wrong. If you just say, oh, they get deformed, you can't win the argument like that, can you? You have to say something more powerful, more convincing. So why are they not as topic? Hmm? There will be, if you try to isotope one to the other, you all agree, a stage where the rubber band looks like this. You agree? I'd like to ask you, at this moment, is the, this loop 
inside sigma 3? No. The loop is not entirely on sigma 3 on the surface. It leaves sigma 3. Do you, do you see why? There's a hole there. And while it's here, it's touching sigma 3, but then it stops touching sigma 3 and it's sort of over this hole. Yeah? So it's not inside sigma 3 at this stage. So we, had to, we said that in order to say whether two things are isolated or not, we have to specify in what ambient dimension. And here, the ambient space, sigma 3 is not large enough to move it over. Who did not understand? Please raise your hands and please be honest. It's a very, very important point, although it's an easy point. So if you do not understand, I want to make sure that everyone understands this before we move on. Who did not understand that this stage, step, is not allowed? Yeah. Because, excuse me, because the L sub t goes outside, partly outside sigma 3. Yeah. So the answer is that they are not isotopic inside the sigma three. Yes, you have a question? Yeah. No. If I say asymptotic inside sigma four, that would be What do you mean sigma four? Sigma four is another thing, like this. I will try to move it from here to here. It's still impossible. What's, what does sigma four mean? Sigma four looks like this, right? You have another hole, another handle. And I, yeah? Do you agree that that's what sigma 4 looks like? You don't agree. You're confused. You are confused. I think I can guess why you're confused. Because you keep thinking, ah, 3, 4, 5. You have forgotten what those 3, 4, 5 mean. 3 of what? 4 of what? 5 of what? Before we were discussing. Three, four, five dimensions. Here, we are saying three, four, two, number of handles. But they all have the same dimension. Is that what we were confused about? Yes? But sigma three does not mean three dimensions. You say, ah, but if you look at your notes, the definition of sigma 3 is the surface, dimension 2 always, which has three handles. That was the de definition. You should not change the definition between Friday and Monday, <laughs> even, though, even though it's tempting to do so. By the way, many things do change over the weekend, of course, but not mathematical, <laughs> mathematical definitions. OK. So sigma 3 simply means that there are three handles. Let's revise, William. How do you call this surface? Sigma two. sigma 2, correct. How do you call, what do you call, excuse me, this surface? Sigma, sigma three. 3, but it's the same dimension. It's always that two dimensions, OK? Good. However, the problem occurred here because the rubber band or the loop and LT left to this surface, was sort of hanging in midair. Of course, if we do the isotopy in a larger space, for example, inside R3, this whole thing, let's say, is inside R3, which you imagine, then they become isotopic. Of course. In fact, they become isotopic in the following way as well. I can make this very large. Yeah. That's OK. I can leave the surface because I have R3 to move stuff in. And then move, and then boop, shrink. So they are isotopic in R3, but not on sigma 3, or not on the surface, outside, yes. Which illustrates, once again, the idea that you have to specify the ambient dimension in which you are trying to isolate. Since we are beginning to become experts in this, a tricky example, which I'd like to give, 
not as a project because I think it's a little too small to be a project. Okay, let's give it as a project because I like easy projects. Okay, so this is a project. I'm going to add this project to the list of projects and ask Jan to put them, share with you and so on. Okay? And so you can do this for next week if you like. And it's relatively straightforward. A tricky example. Let us consider this strip. Do you see what I have just drawn? It is a movie strip with two twists. Hmm? Now, if I start sliding my hand on this side, here I go in the back, and then after one more twist I go in front, and then I go all the way in the rear and come back. So this surface has two sides. It's not like a movie strip which is one-sided. It has two sides. It's orientable. So topologically it is just a copy of this ordinary strip. No twists. Zero twists. Okay, so these are homeomorphic. I hope you agree. Homeomorphic. Okay. Same topological object. Now, the question is are they isotopic? in R3. In other words, can you make this from a sheet of paper or a sheet of rubber, if you like, and by twisting and so on, but never tearing it, cutting it, so bring it into this shape? Who thinks you can? Who thinks this is isotopic to this in R3? Raise your hands. Who thinks that they are not isotopic to each other in R3? I hope everyone think so. And of course they are not isotopic. Answer is no. In Rm for M4, 5, 6, 7, etc. So in what dimension do they become isotopic? Or do they ever, they, are they always not isotopic? Do you understand the question? Okay, I'm going to write it down. So, is there, does there exist, exist some M for which they, are, they become isotopic? In other words, you can deform one to the other without any self intersection, without any cheating in Rm. If the answer is yes, please give me the minimum n yeah, from m onwards, this m onwards. Maybe it's 10, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 245, and so on. If there is no such m, please tell me why there is no such m. That's the project. It's tricky, but it's doable with the knowledge that you have at hand. OK? OK. So that's nice enough. In the first week and for most of today, we have been discussing the following topics in topology. First, we began with lots and lots of examples of manifolds, you know, surfaces and the projective plane and all that kind of thing. And we learned to slide handles. 
We understood more or less, we did not prove it, but we understood the classification of theorem for all surfaces. So in dimension two, we are done. Those, were that, those supplied us with a stock of examples, many, many examples, and incidentally, many pictures, which was the most important thing in this course. Please keep drawing pictures. And then we discussed the concept of moving things around. We formalized the concept of deformation. Isotopy, we called it, inside some ambient space. Now, we shall start discussing a new chapter, and that's topological invariance. Using the concept of isotopy, we shall now produce something like energy. You know when a physical system evolves, after some experiment, something happens, the rain falls on it, and it actually kicks the machine, and so on. Before and after, the energy is the same. That's called the conservation of energy. And sometimes, using the conservation of energy, you can draw, draw lots of interesting conclusions about physics. It's similar. We shall introduce a concept called the intersection number. And that intersection number, this interesting thing, is conserved in the, in the course of deformations. So, chapter 3. Some people call it intersection index. But because the plural of index is, is indices and plural of number is numbers, I think number is an easier word. OK. We'll start counting intersections with not just, oh, those two things intersecting five points. We'll start counting them with plus or minus sign. We will say, ah, this intersection happens, but it has plus sign, this intersection, minus sign, and so on. We will start counting intersections, or crossings, if you like, with signs, in other words, with plus or minus. So some intersections will be counted minus, and some things with plus. Consider two curves inside, let's say, the plane. Let's say that these curves look like this. K and L, OK? In R2. So think of the blackboard as R2, and there are two curves like this. And these curves keep going, but let's not worry about where they go. Let's focus on what happens in this, um, under this microscope. OK, intersecting at, let's call this point P. Choose also an orientation. Orientation for the ambient R2. For example, do you know this abbreviation, EG? It means, for example, in, in Latin it's exemplar generis. Let's say that this is our orientation. You remember the exercises that we did on Friday? So that's the orientation, OK? Yeah. Now, and we shall choose orientations for K and L. Having chosen those orientations, the sign of P is, now, let's consider four cases, because there are four cases. This is K, this is L. Oops. I'm drawing the same picture. They may not look like the same, but please forgive me. They are the same. Um, L, K, K. And that's the point P in each of the pictures. The orientation for the ambient R2 is always this. OK? The standard orientation. Let's say that in this picture, bless you, bless you twice. Atezamuru. Who, who sees twice? 
Who, who was that? Ah, very good. Okay. Okay, so let's say that K is oriented like this. L is oriented like this. K. L. Okay, let me rewrite this. I'm sorry. I would like to be a little more precise. So the sign of the intersection K intersect L, which is P, yeah, is. So I'm being a little imprecise, I'm sorry, but we are taking K and L in this order. K first, L second. Okay? So let me show you what I mean. K first, L second. So that's one and that's two. If you like F1 and F2. Do you think this orientation is the same orientation as the ambient orientation or opposite? It's the same. Okay, you've been well trained. So this is plus. We say that this intersection is plus. What about this? Oops, oh, what, why am I doing this? This is exactly the same picture. That's, <laughs> you see, you should have told me that I'm doing something silly. I want to do this and want to do this, of course. Yeah? Oops, and then this. That's more interesting. Hey? That's plus. How about this? That's one, that's two. Negative. Negative. Okay, we are all together. How about this? Are we sure it's negative? Are we sure? That's one, that's two. Who thinks it's negative? Who thinks it's positive? Who thinks it's something else? <laughs> one, two. If I turn it around, it's one, two. Is it the same as this? It's the opposite. It's negative. Thank you very much. And that, of course, is positive. It's somewhat tricky, but it's one, two now. And when I turn it around, it's the same orientation as the ambient operation. So you now see what we mean by sign, I hope. Yeah? OK. So this is with respect to the ambient operation. And of course, if we had chosen the opposite ambient orientation for R2, all the signs would be reversed. So if we had chosen tricky tense construction in English, if we had chosen um, the opposite orientation, E1 and E2 like this, for R R2 instead, then the signs, all the signs, would have been opposite. Plus would have become minus, minus would have become plus. Yeah. No problem, I hope. Opposite. OK. Here. What about the case? About degenerate cases like this. Let's say that K is like this and L is like this. And they are like that. K and L. And if you put, say, arrow here, arrow here, do you think this is positive or negative? We can't tell. The tangent vectors here So this is K, this is L and I'm going to use cover, excuse me, to do the tangent vectors See? So that's tangent K that's tangent to L yeah. Tangent vector is a parallel or de linearly dependent So we cannot decide plus or minus. Ah, thank you very much. Yeah, it's difficult to see it under reflection. Yeah, so we cannot decide whether plus or minus. Okay. But what do you do 
in mathematics, when you have a degeneracy like this, what do you do? We deform. And you know, this kind of picture, if you think about it, is a very, very exceptional, very perverse picture. For example, you cannot draw this picture on a moving train. If you are on a moving train, it's going da 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 And you try to do this, oops, and then you this. Yeah? Or da 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 oop. You cannot draw this picture on a moving train. Yeah? So pictures that you cannot draw on a moving train are bad pictures. Good pictures you should be able to draw on a moving train. So, but let us deform the degenerate case to generic. Generic means something that you can draw on a moving train. Situations. Situations. Yeah, very important. This. And what you get is as follows. This becomes either this or this, if you shake a little bit. Okay? Now, let's say that here I'm introducing the orientation like this. Here I'm introducing the orientation like this. Let's do the bottom one first. How many intersections are there? No. Intersection has disappeared. So here you get zero intersection. You don't have plus or minus. Here, let's see those two intersections. There are two intersections now. What? Let's keep the same orientation, ambient orientation like this. So this is with respect. To, I'm sorry, I'm coming to this corner of the picture, and it's difficult to see, I, I know, especially for people but with bad eyesight like myself. But let's say this is a orientation standard. Is this intersection positive or negative? K like this, L like this. Yeah, one and two. Hey, can you see, for example, Hussam, can you see from all the way back? You have very good eyes, don't you? So this intersection where K is moving like this and L is moving like this, is this positive or negative with respect to the standard orientation? Positive, positive thank you. So this is positive. That one is negative. Yeah? So in fact, this intersection is one, plus one, minus one. Again, it's zero. So you see, I perturbed it, I shook the picture, I deformed it into generic situations in different ways, but the total is always the same. And this is what allows us to define the introduce the invariant. Okay. Let me mention one more example. So what we have just said is that we get the same sum of signs independently, independently of how we default. French speakers among you, please be careful. Independent in English, E. In French, it's independent, A. But in English, it's E here. Okay. You don't say independent to be. <laughs> How we different? OK, likewise, in a similar fa fashion, let's consider another Degenerate case. Let's say that you have K, which is horizontal, if you like, and L, which is like the cubic curve. Y equals X cubed, if you like. Yeah? So L comes from here and goes through, and K goes straight through. What is the sign of this intersection with respect to 
the orientation that we're always taking, so one and two. We cannot tell because it's degenerate. Okay? So let's shake it. There are two ways to shake. Keep K like this, but think of L as a string. All right? And then tighten the string a little bit. Boop. And then what you get is going to be something like this. Hmm? That's L. That's L. That's K. So this is tighten the string. Like this. If you pull this end and this end a little bit, you get, before they were tangent, now I have a non zero angle here. Another way to deform this into generosity is you loosen it, you push a little bit. Here and here. Can you see? Push a little bit. And as a result, what do you get? You get something like this. Yeah? That's loosening. OK, let's see what kind of intersection numbers we get. Is this intersection, now we have one single generic intersection. Is the sign positive or negative? Yeah, it's positive, but it's easy to see. How about here? We have now three intersections that appeared out of this. This intersection is positive. It looks the same as this picture. This one, negative, negative indeed. K goes that way, L goes that way, so it's one, two, that's negative of this orientation. So that's negative. And finally, it's easy to check, this is positive. So here we get just plus one. Here I get plus one, minus one, plus one, equals, again, plus one. It's the same thing. OK. So it always works. OK. And the point is that both of these are generic pictures. Generic situations. OK. I shall state one um, definition, and then we'll leave it at that. OK. <laughs> now, the mystery of the eraser. Ah, they all converged here. Maybe all the erasers end up on this blackboard eventually. It's interesting. I wonder where erasers go home to sleep. Maybe over there. Looks a bit like Kung Fu, no? <laughs> okay. Okay. Precise definition. Let's say that you have two submanifolds inside an ambient manifold M be such that, first of all, I'm going to say they have exactly the right um, overflow. So they intersect in points. Okay. Like that. The overflow was dimensional k plus dimensional l minus dimensional m, as you recall. But the equal, in other words, the overflow is exactly 0. Overflow 0 means that from Friday, that was Chapter 2, Theorem 1, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, K and L generically intersecting points. Set in discrete points. Let me even say that. So you can count those intersections 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. To each of those discrete intersection points, we'd like to assign a plus or minus sign. How do you do this? If they do, assume that, that at all intersection points, at all these intersection points, K and L are not tangent. In other words, not a situation like this, but a situation like this. Or, not a situation like this, 
but rather stations like this. Okay? So if you like, we can also think of it as follows. E, that is, if um, that they make non-zero angles, that's maybe more intuitive. So they intersect, but at non-zero angles. <laughs> OK, so assume this. Then we say that K and L are transversal. Strange word. Have you ever met this word before? Transversal, transver transverse, and so on. They cut each other nicely. That's what they mean in M. And we shall write K and L intersect in M, but in order to show that they intersect nicely, we're going to put this strange sign. That's the symbol for saying that K and L intersect in discrete points, and at all those intersection points, the angle of the intersection is non-zero, that they are not tangent. So here, they are not transverse, transversal, but here, they are transversal. OK? OK. By the way, this might be a sim letter in Amharic or something like this. What is this? Is that Amharic. No, it's not. OK. Well, it's not a letter in Am Amharic then. OK. Um, I'd like to then show you a number of examples to see if we understand what transversal means. So these are the transversal examples. And then. <laughs> in the moment, non-transversal examples. Let's say that K is like this. And suppose that L comes in and rises like this, just cuts through. Not straight up, but almost. This is transversal. K and L are transversal. And similarly, if you have K like this, and L comes up and rises, and then plunges down, goes down, and then rises again, that's transversal. Okay, so that's transversal, that's transversal. In contrast, in contrast, I needed two erases. not transversal pictures. You can invent those pictures yourselves, of course. You can have K like this. And if you imagine that L comes up, but you see, as it approaches K, imagine that it becomes tangent to K and then goes like this, like the cubic curve that we discussed. That's not transversal. The angle at the, at the point of intersection is zero. Another interesting example of non-transversality is as follows. Suppose that in analogy with the top picture, I come up, but then I come down. I don't dip down. I just touch K, and then I leave. I take off again. This picture is not transversal, because this intersection point is fine. But this, at this point, those two submanifolds are tangent. So that picture is not transversal. Do you understand that transversality is a severe, expensive condition? You have to have non-zero angle everywhere. Even if the condition fails at one point, bang, that disqualifies you from being transversal. Okay. And finally, transversality is a robust, bless you, stable, nice, generic condition. All the adjectives. Condition. Namely, what, what do I mean? Oh. Okay. 
that if k and l are transversal in M, then if you perturb them slightly, if you shake the picture a little bit, if you deform the situation a little bit, small perturbations keep the transversality. Yeah. Whereas, if they are not transversal to begin with, then a small perturbation will make them transversal. As, for example, it happened here. K and L were not transversal at this point, but if I shook a little bit, it became transversal. Any other way will make it transversal. So small perturbations make So you can see that the transversality is a more general condition. Nicer condition, robust, stable condition. Okay. Tomorrow, we shall see many interesting applications of transversality. We have to finish today by defining transversality and not officially defining how you count the intersection number. That's how we shall start next, uh, next time.